I'm going to list off a number of things, and I want you all to try and think about how these things could be connected. An iPhone, a three-course meal, a photograph by Ansel Adams, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, the film American Beauty, New York City, your dinner last night, the most recent conversation that you had, the most recent email that you sent, a 4th of July fireworks show. You might have found a way that all of these things are connected. Maybe the first connection you made between these things is that these are things that people created. These are things that people made. Three years ago, I started studying product design at the College of Design here in Raleigh. But when I first started studying design, the one thing I wanted to learn, the one thing I was most passionate about discovering, the one thing I really just wanted to find out is, are there any guides that we can apply to make these creations better? Are there any fundamental principles that I can follow, no matter what I'm creating, whether it's whether I'm making a film, or whether I'm writing a story, or whether I'm designing a product, or whether I'm making myself a sandwich for lunch. Are there any guides that I can follow no matter what I'm creating? It's a tough question. A lot of people would be like, no, that's ridiculous. You can't tie all these things together. What does a sandwich have to do with a film? That's sort of crazy. But I was always hopeful. And throughout the last three to four years, I've always had this question in the back of my head. By the end of this talk, you'll begin to see how the seemingly random assortment of things that I listed off just a minute ago are not just connected, but you'll begin to see how each one of them follows the same fundamental principles that can make them inherently better creations. This is what I want you to think about. What makes a good creation? What makes a good story? What makes a good film? What makes a good piece of music? What makes a good piece of architecture? What makes a well-designed city or a well-designed event? Is the thing that makes a good story the same thing that makes a good piece of architecture or a good piece of music? How do these things connect? To start out, and to make things a little bit more clear, I want to use the term design interchangeably with the term creation. When I say design, I don't just mean a product design or a graphic design or a piece of architecture. That's what a lot of people think of. That's what comes to mind when you say design. But I want to define design as something bigger. Designers and design thinkers, people who work in design industries, they're always trying to define this term design. I've heard a lot of design teachers talk about this. They're always throwing around abstract terms about what design is and what design means and all this stuff. But I think that Charles Eames, who was a famous industrial designer, he worked in a lot of different industries. He worked in, uh, he designed furniture, he designed architecture, he made some films, he um, made some graphics. He's just an amazing designer. He defined design as this. Design is a plan for arranging elements in such a way so as best to accomplish a particular purpose. Now, this is a really, really good definition. It would be difficult for me to add anything to that, so I'm not going to try. But what I want to do is take what Charles Eames said, Charles Eames smoking his pipe there, <laughs> and trim that definition down just a little bit, broaden it, and say that design is making a choice for a purpose. Design is simply the choices that we make about something towards a change. You can design a photograph by making choices about what's in the frame or what isn't. You can design a piece of music by making choices about what notes or chords you're going to play and when. You can design a conversation by picking out what words you're going to say. We all design our lives by making choices every day about how we're going to spend our time. Design is making a choice. If this is the definition that we're going to use, 
then each one of you is a designer. That also means that every one of these principles that I'm going to share are things that can be applied to things that you do every day. We make designs, we make choices for a lot of different reasons. Every design that we make should be to either communicate something, solve a problem, or to add aesthetic value. We make some decisions, some designs, to communicate an idea, an emotion, or a message. Every kind of design should communicate something about itself. It's almost like how everything about your appearance communicates something. Your posture, your tone of voice, your body language, your clothing. Every design should communicate something about itself. We make some decisions to solve a problem, but sometimes you're not trying to solve a problem, and you make a decision, you make a design to add aesthetic value. As you can see in the way that I've categorized these, all aesthetic decisions communicate something, but not all aesthetic decisions solve problems. You can also see the other way around that not all decisions that solve problems are aesthetic. Now, none of these reasons or combinations of reasons is inherently better than another. Remember what Charles Eames said, design is a plan to accomplish a purpose. If a design is just meant to communicate something and it does just that, it's just as successful as a design that is meant to solve a problem and does that. Now, I've talked about design and I've talked about communication and aesthetics and problem solving, but it's also really important to talk about bad design. Now, this is really important because there are actually two different types of bad design. The first kind of bad design is a design that doesn't do what it's supposed to do. One example of this might be that annoying dishwasher that doesn't quite clean everything off of your dishes. I'm sure we've all experienced some kind of bad design like this at one point or another. I know I have. The second kind of bad design is a design that does what it's meant to do, but that purpose is not a positive one. One example of this is Rebecca Black's song, Friday. I'm pretty sure that the purpose of this song was to be annoying, and it succeeded really, really well, but that's not a positive purpose. It's important to note that something can be a bad design and still follow some of these principles. The first principle that I discovered that makes creations of any kind better is that a good creation should provoke a reaction or cause a change. It's important to know that something can still provoke a reaction or change and be a bad design, just like Rebecca Black's annoying masterpiece. More often than not, if a design does not provoke a reaction or a change, it is either unsuccessful or not useful. It seems really obvious, right? Like everything we make should provoke a reaction, everything we make should cause a change, but it's vitally important. Every kind of design, whether it's the design of a poster, whether it's a sandwich for lunch, whether it's a picture that we take at a party, they should all cause some kind of change in the world around them, either emotionally, like, wow, that was an amazing picture. It really touched me. Or physically, wow, I'm glad I made that sandwich. I'm full now. <laughs> or, or a design of a poster. Oh, there's an event going on next week. I better sign up for that or put it on my calendar. They should all cause some kind of change. This principle is really important when it comes to things like stories. I'm a filmmaker, I like to make films, and so I think a lot about stories and what it means to tell a story. What does it really mean to tell a story? One of my favorite authors defines story as a transformation unveiled. The very core of what a story is is this idea that there's a change that takes place, a transformation in both the characters and the audience. The second principle that I discovered is that a good creation must have strong contrast. In some cases, this might seem obvious as well. If you're familiar with traditional song structure, you know that most song structures look something like this. Now, we have verses, we have choruses, and we have a bridge. I'm sure a lot of you know the bridge is the part of the song that stands out. It's different than the rest of the song. Because it's different, we can emphasize the attributes of the rest of the song. We can emphasize the part of the song that sounds drastically different. 
Photography is another place where contrast is really, really important. This is one of my favorite photographs because it just captures this second principle of contrast. Without contrast, this photograph is nothing. With contrast, this is one of the most beautiful photographs that I've ever seen. Everything in this picture leads your eye to this figure standing on the sand dune. So you might be thinking, all right, contrast, song structure, photography, I get it. You know, these are creative things. Contrast, it works for that. But I've been talking about how these principles apply to all different kinds of creation. I mentioned sandwiches earlier. I mentioned architecture. I mentioned all these different things. So this is what I want you to think about. You all suddenly got really, really hungry, right? No. Why do we like cookies and milk? Why do we like chips and salsa? Why do we eat yogurt with spicy food? The same reason we have a bridge and a chorus, the same reason we like certain wine with certain meat, the same reason our eyes are attracted to photographs like the one I just showed you. We like all of these combinations because the elements are different. Things become fundamentally more exciting, more captivating. We're attracted to them more when there are contrasting elements. The third principle that I discovered is that a good creation follows a defining concept, pattern, or algorithm and applies this concept throughout. Now, these defining concepts can be visual or thematic, but every good piece of creation, whether it's a story, a company, piece of architecture, or even a city, they should all follow a defining concept that is linked with the purpose of what that object is meant to do. Let me give you an example. One of the best examples that I've seen of the defining concept principle is the film American Beauty. This film has one of the best story structures that I've ever seen in a film. I'll get to that in a minute. For those of you who have seen the film, you know that the film follows a man named Lester Burnham, played by Kevin Spacey, who goes through a kind of, you could call it a midlife crisis or awakening or whatever you want to call it. His life is sort of strangely altered. Anyways. By the end of the film, his family falls apart and he begins to see life in a different way. Everything in this film follows one single defining concept. One of my favorite authors defines this concept as the perception of beauty and the effect that it has on people's lives. Now, in this film, as a lot of films, there are a lot of characters, there are a lot of scenes, there are a lot of lines of dialogue, there are a lot of intricate, complex relationships between characters, but everything in this film, everything, serves the purpose of this defining concept. Everything in the film comes back to the perception of beauty and the effect that it has on people's lives. The second example that I've seen of the defining concept principle is the company Apple. We all know Apple, we all love Apple, we use iPods and iPhones and MacBooks and all this other sort of stuff. But what we don't realize is that Apple's defining concept that they use to design all of their products is a single defining concept that they apply to everything. This defining concept is actually adopted from a popular German designer named Dieter Rams, who is famous for his mantra, less but better. Apple has adopted this simple, minimalist design philosophy for how they design all of their products. The fourth principle that I discovered is that a good creation should be unexpected but inevitable. When we see it or interact with it, we shouldn't be able to think of another way that it could have been designed better. People who come in contact with your designs, your family, your uh, coworkers, your friends, they'll constantly be thinking about how they could have been done better. A conversation that could have gone differently piece of music that could have sounded differently, a product that could be used differently or designed better, choices that could have been made differently. The key is to make your choices, make your designs, the kind so that they aren't what people would expect, but people couldn't be more satisfied with the way that you've made choices about what you created. 
There's a catch to this, though. If, I, um, if a design is unexpected, but it doesn't fill its purpose successfully, it's twice as likely to disappoint. For example, if I make you a sandwich with some unexpected ingredients, you're probably going to be much more upset. You're probably not going to want to eat, eat that. I know I wouldn't want to. If someone, a waiter brings me a sandwich and says, here you go, there's some unexpected ingredients on there, I'm going to be like, whoa, like, <laughs> take it easy there. <laughs> there's a kind of magic that's apparent when a creation fulfills a purpose in a way in which no one could have previously imagined. Filmmakers and storytellers love this principle. Filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock and M. Night Shyamalan have mastered this principle in their films Psycho and The Sixth Sense. Now, if you haven't seen these films, I have to apologize because I'm about to spoil them for you. In The Sixth Sense, when you find out for it, that Bruce Willis's character has been dead the entire time, you realize it was inevitable. How many people, when they watched this, they freaked out. They're like, oh my gosh. I don't know. Maybe some of you saw the ending coming. Maybe some of you realized that was what's going to happen before it actually happened. But for most of us, it was both unexpected and inevitable. We couldn't have imagined a better ending. We couldn't have imagined a film where Bruce Willis's character wasn't a ghost. In Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, we get to the end of the film, and it's the same thing. I remember watching this with my uh, siblings, and we just all freaked out. It was crazy what happens at the end. In fact, the ending is so unexpected and so inevitable that I'm not even going to spoil it for you. <laughs> but filmmakers and storytellers aren't the only ones who have to master this idea of inevitability and unexpectedness. Comedians also have to be masters of this principle, because all good jokes follow this same structure. Unexpected, but inevitable. Let me give you an example. An engineer dies and unfortunately ends up going to hell. It's hot and miserable down there, so he looks around and realizes that the AC has been broken for quite some time. So, so he fixes it. What, what would an engineer do? Fix the AC, right? So he looks at the TV and notices that the TV is broken and grainy and messed up as well. So he fixes that too, and they start to get high-definition cable. So one day, God peeks down into hell and realizes that everyone's hanging out and having a good time, and he asks the devil what's going on. The devil says, well, ever since we got that engineer, things have been going great. God says, what? That's a mistake. Send him to me immediately. The devil says, whoa, no, we're keeping this guy. We like him. He fixes things. God says, if you don't send him to me immediately, I'm going to sue you. The devil says, you're going to sue me? Where are you going to get a good lawyer? They're all down here. <laughs> you can see that most good jokes have this structure. They establish a setup, they establish a situation, and then they subvert it completely. They twist it upside down by building up to this unexpected but inevitable punchline. Everything leads up to this one point in the joke. And the last, and I believe most important principle, follows this structure as well. The last principle that I discovered that makes a good creation is that a good creation must escalate and lead to a climactic point. This is my favorite principle because I see it in everything. It almost drives me crazy sometimes how much I see this everywhere. Let's go back to the song structure. Notice the highest point of intensity or emotion. Notice where it is. Everything leads up to this climactic chorus. Everything in the song is leading to this one single point. Let's look at story structure. In a good story, everything comes to a point. Everything builds up to the climactic point of the story. It's also the moment in the story in which the main character faces the most amount of conflict. The main character should be torn. The main character should have to decide between one thing and another. It's also the moment in the story, the film, the book, the novel, whatever, in which the audience sees the most amount of contrast. The audience should see all these situations that could happen, everything that could happen, and contrast that with everything that does happen. Again, back to the unexpected but inevitable. In a good joke, everything leads up 
to this unexpected but inevitable punchline. In a good meal, everything builds up to the main course. In a good photograph, everything leads your eye to one specific point, just like the photograph that I showed you earlier. Everything we create is connected. Everything we create can be made better by the same fundamental principles. I believe that we as a society must start to see things as being more connected or our lives and our communities will become more and more fragmented and more and more inconsistent than they already are. Think about these principles. Test them out. Try them. Apply them to everything in your life. If they work, keep applying them. If they don't, find out why. Find the principles that work. The more that I live and the more that I study design, the more I try to see how all of these things are connected. I would like to invite you. I would like to challenge you to constantly be looking for things, constantly be looking for evidence that proves that all of these things, the cars that you drive, the phones that you use, the music that you listen to, the places that you go to, the events that you attend, the cities that you live in, all of these things, the films that you watch, the pictures that you take, the conversations that you have, and the words that you say are all connected. Thank you.